I suppose that a discussion is normally expected to be able to bind the various presentations and papers together so that they can be presented as actually pointing in the same direction and supporting one another. But I must admit that I have not, at least not yet, been able to see how that can be done. So now I'll take the papers one by one and, and talk to them. And, and starting with Caroline's, I, I think I have actually very little to say because I'm very impressed by the work uh, done for this paper. I think it stands out as a fine piece, easy to read, and it gives a very good overview of the data sets, the differences and the problems involved in each of them and in this kind of exercise. So congratulations for a very nice paper. But of course I have to come up with a few points just to uh, demonstrate that I actually read it. Uh, and uh, I think that, that one of the points will be on page 18, where you present the construction of your measurement of disagreement between the nine data sets you have uh, to work with and decide to work with. And I, I think it's a little difficult to understand, so maybe you should elaborate a little more on that explanation so that even people like myself can understand what you're doing. I also think that you have, well, it, it's very clear you have read the book by Jerry Monk and also the paper by Monk and Verkeulen. But I think it's, it's strange then that you don't include in your assessment of the data sets whether the skates with multiple indicators are additive or multiplicative, as that is such an important point for Monk and, and in the Monk and Verkeulen paper. And, and that's very strange because that could change your assessments of uh, some of the things. And then I thought, when you end up with 706 elections, it could actually be interesting to see if one looked at the country years where these elections took place, if there was any kind of correspondence between your results, results in the uh, compared data sets, and what is actually said about these elections in the various um, indices, Freedom House Policy for Bertelsmann, and so on and so forth, again, to see what the uh, quality of each of them would be. Um, and as it was said this morning, not to find out which one was best, but to see how the bigger, well-known ones um, differ from what you come up with on the basis of your comparisons of the uh, nine data sets. The, uh, the next paper was uh, Tobis on the organizational performance in the EMBs, and I also like this paper because I think it's an important contribution to the study of election malpractice, using, as we just heard, the running of bridge selections as the case. And I also think the paper contributes significantly to a discussion about what electoral malpractice is by clarifying that electoral malpractice is much more than intentional attempts of achieving or trying to achieve the results one would like to see. It must also include all the minor second order irregularities which have been developed because of organizational dysfunctionality, breaches of election staff's duty of care because of carelessness, neglect, or in a, in a, inadequate training, poor leadership, and so on. And I think I'm, I'm on the opinion that it's actually a good idea to separate the various understandings of the term electoral malpractice, as also Dawn hinted at this morning. I like the, the IFAS approach of starting with looking at whether or not the behavior in question is intentional or not, and then taking it from there, leading to a, a distinction between intentional malpractice, which is fraud, and unintentional, which is um, you know, then malpractice in that language. Both fraud and malpractice obviously impacts negatively on electoral integrity. Be that as it may, the paper gives a solid presentation of the electoral management problems in visits in Britain, but I don't intend to take you through that. I just want to say that the problems Toby is dealing with are not new. They have for decades been studied in the policy process tradition where I suppose they represent various implementation problems, partly because of poor performance of what in that tradition, of course, is called street-level bureaucrats who deliver the actual services to the concerned citizens 
that is, the citizens who want to register and the voters who come to vote, partly because of bureaucratic and political interest which influences the electoral management processes. I'll forget all modesty and mention an article by Andy Reynolds and myself in Commonwealth and Comparative Politics 2002, which actually touches about, upon these themes. I think there is a need to work more on the organization of the performance indicators and the failures in steering and rowing because of the way the electoral process is organized, but I look forward to seeing that, uh, the uh, results of that effort. I agree with you that there is a need for comparative research, but I also think that one should think about separating states with more or less uniform administrative environments, and then states like the UK and the USA, as was mentioned this morning also, where each little county or each little local council is given some freedom to do as it likes, which introduces a sort of variation which cannot be good for the overall quality and integrity of the electoral processes. So that distinction between countries would be very helpful. Then the next one was the uh, Borman and Golder article from Electoral Systems earlier this year. This article, of course, as it was said, describes the update of the Golder data set on electoral systems from 2005 onwards, and that is fine. And it's good that it has been updated, but my comments are probably not of much use since I don't think that anything will be changed because of them, even though I think maybe they should. Uh, so I, what I will do is to indicate what I would have preferred to see done differently. Um, and because it's not done differently, I don't think the data set will, use by, will be used by me, um, but that is not a reason for other people not looking into it and maybe consider using it. And I had three reasons for that. The first is that the classification rule number four which requires that an alternation rule under identical and, and sorry that an alternation under identical electoral rules has taken place automatically excludes countries like South Africa, Botswana, Tanzania, and probably at least a handful of other countries from being registered as democratic. And I think that's a strange requirement to put in, and uh, it will not. I cannot work with it in my work and. I think it also misrepresents the map of Africa like we saw when you put up here. It's, it's all white still, because there are no, almost no democratic countries in Africa. And I know one can discuss to what degree that's the case, but I think it's a very strict rule you have there, which at least diminishes the usability of the data set. Some of you will also know that I'm not too happy about the way you classify your dependent correctional mixed system, what is often called MMP systems, because I see them as primarily proportional, and your description of how they function, page 363, second column on the top, is not something one cannot discuss and interpret differently at least. Uh, these systems, and for instance in Germany, are not primarily established to correct distortions, but to secure overall PR in Parliament. And that is why some of the two-tier sy PR systems have more in common than you indicate. I have also previous work on that. Then on, in Figure 5, you provide descriptive statistics on the various subcategories. For multi-tier systems, you use the lowest electoral tier, which, for those of you who are familiar with Ernst Leipart's work, is not what he's doing, because he's using the decisive tier. And, and I think Leipart's idea and, and way of doing it is more meaningful, especially coming from a multi-tier system myself, where only the upper level counts. But what you do is to categorize Denmark by the unimportant lower tier. So I think that leads at least to one misclassification um, so that's are my main problems with, with your paper. 
Then uh, the one on which on, on at least on the draft paper is written by someone I, whose name I can't pronounce, Jim Milkinson's book, the combination of the four. The, the authors want to analyze whether or not the degree to which stipulations about electoral management and adjudication can actually be found in the country's constitutions or not, and what the effect of that is. And data are from the so-called Comparative Constitutional Project, CCP, are described in the appendix, and are said to cover all written constitutions from 789. That's really impressive, and again, I've been thinking on my from my Danish background, if you really have looked into all six constitutions, whether you see them as new or system changes, that if you have that, I'm even more impressed. I have a couple of problems with the paper. I know it's the first take on this topic, so I hope there'll be time to work on it. And the first thing is that the introductory paragraph, where you take your starting point on the situation in Kenya is as, in my opinion, as wrong as it can be. Uh, you start by talking about the thousands of people who died after the 2007 elections. It's unknown how many who died, but they were not counted in their thousands. That was in their hundreds. The standard uh, assumption is about 1,300, and that's it. But it, you know, by saying in thousands. Then what you say about the counting and the situation is also a little unclear. And then you go on to say that the recent election, March 4th, was sound, based on sound electoral management and trustworthy dispute resolution. It seems it made all the difference in Kenya. I think that assessment is, is completely wrong. All people who know something about the elections in Kenya are in full agreement. They, they were just as poorly administered as the ones in 2007. The difference was that the political actors decided to accept the outcome. The Supreme Court ruling was also not based on evidence, but on political expediency. And therefore, I think the, the assessment is um, you should reconsider it. Mm -hmm. um, the way you conceptualize electoral management or EMBs to cover both electoral administration and electoral adjudication or what takes place during and after election is, as I see it, a little more confusing than helpful. Uh, at least as I see these two main functions as the way I see them. I don't think it's a good idea to include electoral adjudication under the umbrella of electoral management if we are dealing with the various kinds of courts, electoral, ordinary, which I think you tend to overlook a little bit, supreme or constitutional. They are and should be seen as separate institutions, part of the judiciary, and not either part of the executive or independent uh, EMBs. Um, which are, was almost solely responsible for electoral administration. And by the way, when you list the EMB task, I think you should also include matters like registration of voters, delimitation of constituencies, recruitment and training and staff, and so on. I have no count, but I suppose that ordinary courts are actually most used to adjudicate electoral complaints not finalized in the EMB system, but you don't say much about such courts, um, if I remember correctly. The problem often is that the ordinary courts are not well equipped to deal with electoral issues, as you say, but also that electoral complaints are sometimes lined up in the same queue as other matters before the courts, and therefore they, in some grotesque cases, are only dealt with after the holding of the next election, uh, where it becomes more or less unimportant uh, what, what, what the verdict is. So the issue of the time pressure on solving election-related dispute issues fast is very important and, and should be brought up more in the paper. 
You don't explain how you measure the level of democracy, uh, not even in a, in a little note, or who you rely on. So I think you should do that also. And I think you're yourself very hesitant about what the results of the data analysis is. My guess would be that that has to do with both the problems in your data set, the way it's, they are operationalized, the use of the, the, the um, dominant use of binary coding, and reliance on less than perfect data, um, and the nature of the problem. So they, I think there is a need to rethink what you actually want to do. The, the last paper is uh, Alistair Clark's on the spending on election matters and for election quality. I like this paper uh, on the relationship of these two points, even though I doubt that the implicit hypothesis on which the pa paper builds, that the better funded elections are, the higher their quality, is so widespread as, as you seem to indicate. Um, the paper goes on to analyze how performance is related to spending. This is interesting and important, but it must be remembered, I think, that the performance of the returning officers is primarily based on self-reporting, which is not the most reliable of all data collection methods. And you also report on top of page 11 that some of the original scores had to be um, regraded by the Electoral Commission because the data collectors themselves did not trust the data. Uh, Alistair therefore claims, or not therefore, but you claim, that uh, the data, because of this regrading by the Electoral Commission, can be considered relatively reliable assessments of the standard of election administration office within councils. You did not convince me. Um, because the, it was based on a sample. And how can you know that that sample was done in such a way that all the problems were actually solved? I also have a problem with the index, which is that it is additive uh, at the same time as one of the items, the one on integrity, is of a very different nature from the others, as I see it. Um, and it's probably also more important than the other ones, but it still only counts one-seventh. The, the standard problem with additive indices. We don't have time to go deeper into this, but I think you should look more into that and think about how to, how to deal with a complicated issue. The initial analysis confirms that there is a positive relationship between the three types of spending and the overall electoral integrity, as you have on page 12. Um, I suppose that in, in electoral integrity is here used as a general term, which might be confusing when it's also the label on one of the scale items. The analysis and the test of the four hypotheses is interesting, but the coefficients are often weak and relationships in some cases not significant. Uh, but what stands out is that there is a positive relationship between overall spending and self-reported performance, and also between um, spending on registration alone and self-reported performance, in particular in London and the metropolitan districts. I like the paper, even though I have these problems with the nature of the items and the self-reporting, um, because that together raises issues of both validity and reliability. My own thinking, which I would like you to, to uh, think about or reflect about, is that spending on registration might be causally connected to some of the things which also drives good performance, which is or could be the returning officer's approach to tasks at hand, their diligence, and so on, so that the relationship revealed in the paper might actually be spurious. Um, this, of course, necessitates further research and that is precisely what Alistair himself advocates. So we are in complete agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, I know it's about time, but I think it's, f well, first of all, we started seven minutes later than we should have, so we have time. So I th and that's one thing. Second, I think it would be fair if you guys wanted to comment. And third, it would be good to have some questions from the audience. So you want to 
we take consider also the questions and then we can do a final round in order for saving time. So, uh, Sarah, first, please. <coughs> Um, a question specifically for you. It's something that um, sort of relates to a number of the papers. That a, a number of people have mentioned this distinction between uh, what you call sort of uh, malpractice being an intentional thing, um, sort of malefic intent, and um, uh, unintentional, so what you say mispractice or maladministration, or basically poor practice. But there's a third category that um, occurred to me when, when you were presenting your paper that I'm not sure how it would fit in, but I think it's actually quite relevant in a lot of contexts, and that's um, failure to enforce something, intentional failure to enforce an aspect of the system. For example, you can think of the UK with um, failure to enforce uh, sanctions against uh, not registering to vote, um, which is very rarely enforced, or in other countries um, it might be failure to enforce compulsory voting, or failure to enforce sanctions um, against uh, violations of campaign uh, spending regulations, or simply lack of sanctions, so that you know um, there's no sanction against a violation of something, so basically that regulation is not enforced. And I wonder how that sort of fits into the schema, because I think that is a relevant category that hasn't really been discussed, so maybe rather than just two categories, there should be three. Um, but I asked a why would any um, electoral administrators in their right mind spend a whole lot of money on registration? But you think if you were strategic, you would spend less money on registration, then you'd have more money to left, left to spend on voting operations and more money to spend per capita because you'd have fewer voters to deal with. If you spend a lot of money on registration, you have lots of voters, the chance that you know things will go wrong, you have queues, you get, you know, you'd think that you would have the opposite of what you found. I was just wondering if you could sort of comment on um, why aren't um, uh, electoral managers being a bit clever and more strategic? Are they really that ethical? Um, Paul? Um, I have two quick questions. Though actually from the US, yes, they actually are ethical. <laughs> they want to register voters. That's why they're in this business. I have a comment for um, Carolyn and a question for Zach. On, on Carolyn, uh, I really wa like what you've done and collected this information. And so, of course, when I had the time here, I started picking and poking into some of these. And so I I'm, don't think you're being completely fair to some of the authors. So it's easy to say go back and do more, but I'm, I'm going to suggest you might want to. And just, just two in particular. So Sarah's, um, Sarah Birch's data set, um, which you laud for having multiple measures and having um, the oper operationalization of the main indicator having multiple measures, but unless the, I'm missing the data set I just pulled up, her final measure of integrity is just measuring election observation reports. So she's got lots of measures, but the summary measure is a single measure. That's okay, That's what she's doing is coding election observation reports. Then you criticize Munk for having having one having one indicator, but I actually think he has four indicators. And then you criticize him for not having multiple coders, but it was an expert survey. Why would you have multiple coders of an expert survey? So I, I absolutely understand the criteria you're using here. Um, it's extremely valuable. In some ways, I think you're lumping disparate data collection methods under one kind of umbrella, and I'm not sure it, it works um, that well. The quick question for Zach is if, um, have constitutions gotten longer over time? And so longer, more complex, and so some of the reasons some of these things are coming in is because they're more complex. And if anybody wants to see a great website for data, that I'll give you a thumbs up for that one. All the, that's a fantastic website, so that should be a model for other people to look at. Thanks. Thanks, and finally down here, Adrian, and after that we just have uh, the answers. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Norris, for inviting me. Uh, definitely, I have listened to all the papers, and I think it's they're wonderful. However, I have a, a general commentary. Up to now, most of the papers have dealt with the electoral process itself. Uh, if we recall figure one of the paper by Professor Norris, he underlines the importance of uh, examining the electoral integrity within the whole process. Up to now, I have not seen papers dealing with 
the pre-electoral phase nor the after electoral phase. I think they're very important because if we think of the electoral cycle as such, there is a concatenation of all the cycles. For example, in Mexico, after every presidential election, you have a constitutional reform. And these phases are not taken into consideration. As a matter of fact, now in Mexico there is an initiative to replace the Federal Electoral Institute for a new National Electoral Institute, which is due precisely to the electoral phases. Therefore, I think, uh, I don't know how the papers were chosen or if they were elected personally, but I think if, you, if we want to have a, a balance, a volume, it would have been interesting to have had papers dealing with, with all, with these other phases that are not taken into consideration. Uh, why? Because I think it's also a question of the institutional design. It's not just the malpractice, it's also the form in which the institutions are designed. All right. It's not just management, it is also the design that have to be taken into consideration. Some, not all the electoral institutions are the same also. Some of them, yes, they have the management character, but also they have a judicial aspects. Therefore, I think uh, we have to have, we have to take into consideration all these aspects in order for us to be able to make a, a more comprehensive uh, study of the electoral uh, integrity around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's wrap it up like how you want to respond very quickly. Who Should we need to say more? Or yeah. Yeah. So, so. Well, Professor Euclid, thank you very much for your comments. Really great. Um, I'll think about that and rewrite the paper accordingly. And just to respond quickly to, to Paul, um, as regards to Sarah's data set, I used actually only the multiple indicators, and actually this is what Sarah also does in her in her book. So she doesn't use the overall indicator, which she convincingly argues I think is flawed. Sorry, Sarah, it's really awkward to discuss this with you present. Uh, <laughs> I find. <laughs> as regards Munch, um, his conceptualization is incredibly good. It's it's wonderful. It's just he, he only measures clean elections with one indicator. So it is one indicator. And in terms of experts, uh, we've just seen with the expert index, experts are very much like citizens, which means they are probably very much partisan motivated as well. So I would always include multiple experts. It's, I think it's extremely important to, to limit bias. <coughs> um, well, thank you for both your comments. Uh, just to Sarah on the failure to enforce, I think I'll have to think about that one. Um, and, and to Jorgen about, um, is there anything new about this? Um, I think you're quite right. I mean, uh, especially when you mention the concepts like street level bureaucrats, I mean, these have been things that the public administration has been talking about for, they say, since the 1970s, but it's still relatively new uh, for the study of elections. And I think that's, uh, this, is, this, is, this is an important theme. And it's, there's a new area here of bringing theories from public administration and applying it to, to elections. So there's a, a scope for, for, for a lot of further work here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the alternation rule, classifying countries as democracies or not, I mean, that's not my role. It's just one of the 
three main ways of classifying democracies. Well, the reason why we use that is our database is entirely objective. There's nothing subjective about any of the variables that we have, and this is the objective measure of democracy. There's, and, it, and because of that, it doesn't build in any circularity about election outcomes. You can use that measure of democracy for, for more questions. In regards to MMP versus dependent, as the paper indicates, it's just a, it's just a labeling issue. Most, some people use MMP, I call it dependent. I prefer labels that are informative, and I think dependent's more informative because it indicates that the number of party list seats that a party gets depends on the number of majoritarian seats that have been allocated. That, that, that's the dependency there. And MMP seat systems don't guarantee proportionality. In fact, that's the reason why the Constitutional Court in Germany has just ruled basically all post-war elections in Germany is unconstitutional because they don't actually produce proportionality because of the overhang seats, et cetera. And in terms of the, 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 the graph that shows the number of systems that use the different systems at the, at the lower tier, that was the, the data on each tier is available in the data set. This is just a graphical display of some of the data. So depending on your purpose, you might be interested in the decisive tier. Depending on your question, you might be interested in what's happening in the lowest tier. Zach? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jürgen, for the comments. And uh, I, I, I think you're absolutely right about the characterization of the Kenyan case. In some ways, uh, uh, we developed that as uh, a very quick anecdote to think about what happens when you shift uh, to a new constitution with very different provisions, and you have election, and that is the intervening event between two elections. And um, it's, it's quite possible we're too glib about that, I mean, in terms of the number of deaths and also in terms of how we characterize um, the perception of the management of those two elections. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, some of the mixed results have to do with uh, the binary classification of the success, if you want, of elections. And that's what, in some ways, we start with uh, those binary classifications that are in the Hyde and Marinoff data and um, in the Kelly data. And of course, those are more nuanced once you dig into them, and perhaps we should um, get some more granular measures. Um, and then, um, Paul, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Um, there is a strong correlation between these modern co uh, constitutions, uh, their length in the number of words, and whether they uh, include provisions for electoral management bodies. I mean, in some ways, uh, it seems to be that modern constitutions are such that they're uh, incorporating, incorporating more and more areas. There is uh, a, a set of constitutions that are off the diagonal, that is really long constitutions that for whatever reason don't deal with electoral management, and uh, some very short ones that do, in fact. And so that's, those are kind of interesting cases, but in some ways these, you know, just taking on this other topic is an outgrowth of, of of constitutions continually swallowing these more uh, sort of topics that you would think of would, would belong in more ordinary law. And yes, we do have a great website, but we're redesigning it this summer, so stay tuned. <laughs> Alistair? Um, thank you very much for your, your comments, Jorgen. Um, they're all very, very helpful. Most of them I'm, I'm sensitive to, and this is why I, I think, you know, I said these are very tentative findings. Um, we do need to <coughs> confirm these by additional analyses, additional controls, and so on, to make sure that these relationships ain't spurious or, or that kind of, of thing. And the idea about um, perhaps waiting, um, if I remember right, why it was um, the integrity standard, I think it's a good one. I'll take that away and, and, and think about it. Um, very, very useful. Sarah, um, to your point about registration strategic, I don't know, is the answer. Um, I have a sense it's to do with how the money is actually allocated and what they can claim, but I don't know. I need to go and have a think about that, but it's a very helpful. Thank you. So, uh, well, I, we took a bit some more time, but I think it was worth it. Let's have a coffee break, but let's meet at o'clock if it's fine with you, and we meet at 5.30, right? So great everything, and thank you. Thank you.